Morning, Isabella. It's Larissa here. Thank you so much for the invitation to read for the Dead Poets reading. Um, I woke up this morning and really sort of felt the, the urge to do it. So here I am. I've been thinking in particular, you know, about a lot of the women writers who I've admired so much and who have passed, who have been such powerful influences on me and my own work. Um, I think of a couple of fiction writers, especially Octavia Butler and also Angela Carter, who wrote all those um, feminist retakes of fairy tales. Ursula Le Guin, also the feminist spec fiction writer who, who passed um, recently, I think two years ago. Um, for some reason on my mind this morning also was the sociologist Roxana Ng, um, who it seems we used to talk about a lot. She was a sociologist who um, was interested in women of color and garment workers in particular. And I remember, you know, when she was alive, um, folks used to talk about her often and we really, we seem to somehow have forgotten. And so on my mind very much, you know, is that just that recognition that that tends to happen with women and especially BIPOC women, and especially, you know, queer and GBLTQ2S um, folks who do important work and then somehow when they pass, they seem to slip away from us. Um, and so now in this strange time of, of the, of the COVID-19, um, for some reason, all of that stuff feels like it's kind of crashing in on me. I'm thinking about these folks. Anyway, this morning I'm going to read a little bit. Um, I'll see how far I get. I, my head was full of many people. Um, so I'll, I'll read, I'm going to try to read like little short bits and I'll say something a bit about the folks. Um, so the first poet that I would like to read a little bit from is um, my old friend Sharon Poole Turner, who we lost just two years ago um, here in Calgary. I've known her since the late 90s. Um, a very dear, warm, generous human, um, Métis, um, lesbian, uh, who suffered a lot of trauma and left us uh, half a dozen books. Um, so here's a little piece from Creole Métis of uh, French Canada, me. It's called The Longhouse, and it starts with um, an epigraph from Evelyn T.R. Boyce. There are people who... Sorry, there are people who will try to hurt you because of the good they see in you, needing that good for themselves. They'll try to beat it out of you. When you come to know that, don't become like those people. I dream of a large room where the wind blowing indoors doesn't seem out of the ordinary. Though the room is full of people, I feel alone, lonely for a friend. My childhood home was like that, like I didn't belong, with my mom stretching out a silence I wasn't meant to break. The silence concerned me, my mom teaching the older ones, the younger ones, the dangers of me. My biggest flaw was that I was too nice, too kind, not natural, my mom would say. Born evil, that one. Watch your back. In dream world, there are mirrors up above in the large room. I can see myself, and each strand of my hair contains volumes of knowledge forming along the waves. The wind picks up words like dust from my hands, my skin, my hair, swirling them into a tiny twister whose point reaches into my left eye. And rather than close my eyes, I hold them open to the harshness of those words, the blinding sting that opens a doorway to the past. I'm reminded of a story I heard some years ago where Trickster loses her eyes after juggling them for too long, even though she's warned this will happen and her eyes don't return. She starts to go around with flowers in her empty sockets, telling the people she encounters how special her eyes are and how she can see things no one else can see. Person after person offer to trade one eye for one of hers until one day a girl offers to trade both her eyes for these special eyes that can see things no one else can see. When the trade is made, the girl is left without sight. But the girl knows that darkness holds stories and songs of great power, and when she recounts them in her mind, they shift her thoughts away from herself 
to the voices of women who came before her. She dreams about her grandmother. In the dream, she's a teen and there are other kids, lots of them, maybe sisters and brothers and cousins. Her grandmother has them all helping to clear out a canoe, a very, very long canoe that's large enough for an extended family. The canoe was made from bark, not from wood. Because she's the oldest, her grandmother asks her to go out with the canoe and ret retrieve a medicine from the bottom of the water. The water is dark and murky. It takes several dives before the girl is able to pull up the medicine for her grandmother. She knows this is a powerful healing medicine. When she reaches the surface after her final dive and opens her eyes, she's in a circle of women. She goes around the circle, shaking the women's hands, introducing herself. She reaches her mother, surprised she's there. When they shake hands, they laugh and shake hands again. Her mother's hand feels like her own hand, like she's shaking her own hand. Her mother's talking and the girl leans down to hear what her mother is saying, her left ear to her mother's mouth. Her mother makes a joke in her ear. The girl tells a joke back, wakes herself up laughing. So I just love that one because, you know, there seems to be so much healing in it. Um, it's a prose poem. I should have shown you. Um, they're all sort of lineated, you know, like, um, like, st like stories. They're stories, but they are also poems um, recognizing, you know, the oral tradition from which um, Sharon and folks like her come. Um, I also wanted to read a little bit um, from Claire Harris, who is an other poet um, who really seems to have um, slipped away from us. She passed away in 2000 and, 2009. Uh, I first met her when I was here in Calgary um, doing a writer in residency that's now just called the, the University of Calgary Writer in, uh, writer in Residence. Um, actually, it's called, the, <laughs> it's called the Calgary Writer in Residence. Um, so I was doing that. Claire lived here um, and she was uh, really concerned about mentorship for younger writers. And she used to have a small handful of us over to her house from time to time. And she would, you know, she would teach us things. She'd give us like a little workshop each time and she'd talk about poetry and um, she would give us exercises to do and we would hang out and laugh together. It was really, really wonderful. And then I lost touch with her. Um, and I found out, you know, probably a year or two after she passed, which was still like maybe 20, 2011, 2012. By the time I, I found out, she, she had passed in 2019. Uh, so here is um, a poem of hers called K in Summer. It's Claire Harris, K in Summer. Someone waiting in the lobby of a hotel imperial amid the spaciousness, tourists, and peeling gold leaf, might see it all as too hesitant for truth, might think for a moment about the art in scattering too solidly carved tables, crowding too many dreams before dim Victorian sofas, might remember certain high-backed chairs or a woman that could lend a touch of veracity to this place. From this, might wonder if truth is possible, if always and everywhere there is the notion, stage as true as a bed, as of a lobby. Imagine now Kay as she steps through glass doors and someone who, glancing up, sees her suggest everything is possible, no, is probable in this place. Someone who can tell from the easy music of her walk how decades and sophistication have slipped from her without a rustle. How she has stepped into these brighter, softer eyes, into this clear, joyous laughter without memory. Such a man now, iron gray and ramrod, may welcome years hovering about her bare feet scent of prairies, songs of experience and struggle, may insist only on allegory, glitter and glass slippers, smile on a killer toy. From the roof garden, 
Opposite, our old man ungentle in this summer night gestures furiously, slashes at his wheelchair. A daughter burdened with wet sheets hurries to hang them, then kneels before the old one to rub his hands between her own until he smiles. I turn away from this worrying, its meaning, its small beauties, tiny hungers and comforts, how like an electric charge the attentions of one. They step together into the leafy romantic air and Las Ramblas, K, jaunty as hell, her summer affairs, the slow-burning flame that make autumn bearable, that perfumes her air as she moves towards the grave, its slow, inexorable stages. Jane Flat, in her deck chair, calls to me. She didn't come to Barcelona for love. Love is hard. One wants something softer, only a little pain, a little grace, and limited fallout. Our last evening, I search for the world that is resolution to her story, but she dances down stone streets, shimmies in tavernas, spins in the dim light, that spurious lobby. Perhaps more allegory, perhaps someone watching closely will see her catch her lower lip between bruising teeth on the stroke of midnight. Now, high above the city, we stand on that terrace. I am saying, look, look where we are. The rotting stone, the ragged haze from a thousand years of intention, the avenue, those trees. Listen, she says, listen to bells carve the hours. Oh, that's Claire Harris. We just lost our good friend Ken Belford. I'm going to read a man, a man's work. Um, just uh, this past week. Um, so it's very sad. I know that his partner, Cy Traskin, and his good friend Rob Buddy were just um, uh, were just uh, having a, a celebration of life um, up in Prince George uh, last week. Um, I first met Ken at the Kootenai School of Writing when it was sharing space with Spartacus Books. Uh, can't remember how long ago now, but we became good friends. And um, I used to visit with him whenever he would come to Vancouver. And then one time him and Rob invited me up to up to PG. And I have a, me a memory of going to an Idle No More teach-in with him. And he was a very, very dear man. Uh, very, um, very open, very engaged, a man who had done his, done his homework in, in many arenas, um, specifically uh, around relations uh, with women, um, and also around um, uh, settler indigenous relations. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really um, in grieving him. Here's his book, Decompositions, one of his books. Uh, I also have this lovely one I could have, I could have read from, um, which is, uh, um, uh, off of uh, Meredith and Peter Quartermain's um, chapbook press, When Snakes Awaken. But I'm going to read from this decompositions. It is this. There are barriers within all things, densities in streams having to do with the relationship between abundance and habitat. And this homogenous variance becomes, like me, the surrogate measure I'm the simpler second model, not the sum of the men or the mean, not the egg to fry, but here and there, the lower valley slopes and the uncertainties of the upper nass means abundancy is typical in the lower reaches where the water is deep. When the summer is late and the channel narrows and the pools of the streams in the area dry up, always they may or may not be. I wanted to read a little bit of Connie Fife's work. Um, she's somebody I haven't seen from the 90s, never knew hugely well. Um, an indigenous lesbian uh, based in Toronto. Um, also, I just I wanted to show this book because um, this book was a huge deal when I was in my 20s. Uh, it's called Peace of My Heart. It's an anthology of um, uh, lesbian of color um, writing. Uh, put together by Makeda Silvera, who ran Sister Vision Press, 
Um, it's a really important uh, GBLTQ2S press um, and BIPOC press, um, focusing uh, on, on um, uh, well, focusing on, on women, I guess. Um, in a moment, you know, um, in a moment when we were thinking of gender slightly differently, I guess. Uh, so progressive in its moment. Times have shifted and moved on. Um, anyway, here's a poem. There's one piece from Connie Fife, and I just, I wanted to read it. Distances. Last night, deep in the womb of Mother Earth, my prayers for you, whispered to my grandmothers, were answered. On this night, the spirits will protect you in ways I cannot. Pull those blankets closer to your woman's skin. Wrap yourself in blankets of snow under skies of woman's color. And once, only once, acknowledge the spirits who will watch over you in ways I cannot while so many miles away. Know they are strong and willing to protect you in this, your most vulnerable state. On this night, touch my hair as I too wrap myself in blankets of snow. I just wanted to read a little um, quick scrap from um, Roy Kuka also. This is the beautiful anthology that Roy Miki put together a number of years ago now. Um, my favorite always are the pear tree poems. So I'm just gonna read a little teeny bit from the pear tree poems. How to qualify a pear tree without pointing at the sky. I lean out of the study window to sniff the clear October night. There's one, two, three half-bitten pears hanging in the mid-air. Under skeletal branches, a motley of bruised pears toll the end of another summer, another fall, flagrant heat heart and all, up in the air or down on the ground, all creatures, large and small, begin by biting the air. These bitten pears bear the flesh of. Um, and I'll just close with a little bit of Adrian Rich. I love this book so much, The Dark Fields of the Republic. Um, so has been very influential influential um, since I was quite young. I'll read the epigraph too, which is from the great Gatsby. It struck me when I first read it and it still strikes me now, maybe especially in the time that we're living. He had come a long way to this blue lawn and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. And I'll just read the first poem from, um, from the collection called What Kind of Times Are These? There's a place between two stands of trees where the grass grows uphill and the old revolutionary road breaks off into shadows near a meeting house abandoned by the persecuted who disappeared into those shadows. I've been walking there, picking mushrooms at the edge of dread, but don't be fooled. This isn't a Russian poem. There, This is not somewhere else, but here our country moving closer to its own truth and dread, its own ways of making people disappear. I won't tell you where the place is, the dark mesh of the woods meeting the unmarked strip of light, ghost-ridden crossroads, leaf mold, paradise. I know already who wants to buy it, sell it, make it disappear. And I won't tell you where it is, so why do I tell you anything? Because you still listen 
because in times like these, to have you listen at all, it's necessary to talk about trees. So interesting, hey? Sort of thinking about um, our moment, you know, thinking about the earth as well in ways that perhaps we didn't so much or not, or we're just beginning to um, in that early 90s moment. That's 1991. Anyway, Adrian Rich, huge, huge loss. Oh, what has happened here? Uh-huh. Okay, Isabel, sorry, my computer was glitching, doing weird things um, uh, for a second. Um, but that's what I've got. Thank you so much for the invitation. And um, yeah, just sending out um, all my best and warmest wishes for uh, all, all, of, all of my friends out there. Um, as we are moving through this very strange and difficult time, um, take care of yourselves, take care of your people. Um, yeah, be well. And, um, I hope to see many of you, um, sometime sooner rather than later. Okay. Bye-bye.